Across social media, TikTok, and even conversations offline I'm having with people in real life, there seems to be this refrain repeated over and over again. Media literacy is dead. This lack of comprehension is evidence in things like supposedly hidden Easter eggs, really being key elements of plot or backstory in movies, or audiences having difficulty assessing the validity of a news source, or significant to this video, the idea that writing about a bad character makes the creator or those that watch that movie or read that book bad themselves by default. Some people blame it on the cinema sinsification of media analysis, the way it encourages the gamification of criticism. Others see it as tied to the moral policing of problematic creators and creations that paint a black and white view of what art is safe to be consumed. Others still look to the state of education, to the COVID lockdowns, to the inevitable decline of Western society. But whatever the cause, it seems to be having an effect that's noticeable enough to reach all corners of the internet and outside of it as well, influencing people's information acquisition about the world at large, as well as moral frameworks and the social pressures that run along Inside them. And this inevitably has an impact on how we must talk about representation in this day and age if we want to expand beyond the closed bubble of academic hypotheticals. Because the questions about representation that weren't actively hostile used to be able to be split broadly in two. Firstly, looking at representation that was for the group being represented itself, which often dug into nuances and complexities that used a general base level of knowledge as its starting point. And then secondly, looking at representation which was aimed at as a wider society to teach lessons or spread awareness. Often the criticism of marginalised representation focuses on the latter, pointing out that these stories often seek to appease the worst of mainstream audiences, to keep within the lines of propriety, to ensure it can't be used as self-righteous propaganda against us. It's representation that asks, is now the time for this kind of thing? It's is this what the community needs? What does this tell the general public about us? And with that lens, the questions are ultimately about how much you care about the opinions of the general public and how much power they have to affect the community. It's risk versus reward. But I think the idea that it is specifically this external audience that we must be concerned with is an optimistic view. One that I know that I've held myself over the years that assumes good faith, not just in the filmmakers and writers, but also the audience itself. It assumes that queer audiences will be able and willing to engage with nuanced, messy, intra-community stories. And right now, when we look at the examples posted online, videos on TikToks, comments and reviews that don't just miss the point, but use that misreading to actively oppose the art in the first place. That's when even our discussions of representation have to adapt. I know there are some amazing video essays already here on YouTube digging into the history of queer villains or asking if we need more or less of them, but I wanted to do something a little different in this video, in light of these conversations around the three points of an increasingly apparent triangle, media literacy, moral purity, and complex representation. And what better way to do so than to dig into the lowest of the low, the monsters to the Hayes Code Dr. Frankenstein, the source of revulsion, obsession, and desire the queer villain. I want to first look at some classic examples to set the scene. I could cover any number of tropes here, but to stop this video essay from being hours long, let's keep it to two specific manifestations of queer villainy. To begin to unpick what exactly is going on here, before we move on to the part of this video essay where things get a bit more messy. The first is the obsessive queer. Under this umbrella, we see a number of different iterations, but the thing that links them together is often the stereotypes they are tied to, like the predatory lesbian character, whose seductive nature works to recruit innocent would-be heterosexual girls into her, sometimes literally, vampiric clutches. The very origin of the vampire genre, in fact, Carmilla, is the prototype of this dynamic, with the titular vampire seducing the innocent Laura to her potential ruin. This story has subsequently inspired a number of adaptations and other works, including films like the Vampire Lovers from 1970 that Jazza and I covered on the Queer Movie podcast a few months ago. Compared to male homosexuality that was functionally criminalised in England for many years, lesbian activities never have been, although such legislation was proposed. You can see in the court documents the reasons why it was eventually rejected, including the idea that the more you advertise vice by prohibiting it, the more you will increase it. The mainstream narrative being that women weren't necessarily naturally lesbians for the most part, but could be seduced 
seduced or persuaded into that viceful activity by undue villainous influence, like a kind of contagion. Within this obsessive queer category of representation, we also have the depraved bisexual, whose immorality in other areas of their life is heightened by their apparent voracious sexual appetites they use not for love, but for manipulation and self-satisfaction. Whatever their specific identity or nebulous lack of one, the obsessive queer locks onto their intended victim with a terrifying single-mindedness. A Simple Favour, for example, the, in my opinion, excellent 2018 thriller starring Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively, tells a story of a widowed single mother, Stephanie, who befriends another parent of the school, Emily. Emily is sophisticated and confident and seems to actually like Stephanie. Stephanie is fully under her thrall, when one day Emily disappears and Stephanie is left investigating her supposed murder. The movie plays with the ways attraction can heighten things, especially the nature of desire as an internal feeling that leaves you in many ways out of control of your own mind and bodies simultaneously. When we're talking about a serial con woman like Emily, it's also about desire being something that can be manipulated, how you can be seduced and enticed. Emily in fitted suit and workwear, Stephanie in twee feminine housewife dresses. The reveal of queerness when the two kiss shatters the illusion of heteronormativity, giving an element of chaos that combines with bisexual stereotypes of promiscuity to heighten the unpredictability of character and plot both for outside audiences. We also see this coding in queer erotic villains like Oliver in Saltburn or Tom Ripley in The Talented Mr. Ripley. These are characters whose obsession pushes right up to the boundaries of queerness, playing on the implications, making an audience unsure if this unnaturally villainous character is in love with their victims, or if their levels of obsession become a kind of mirror image to pure, all-encompassing romantic love. Oliver's interest in Felix, and by extension his family, is perverted by the way it is tied to other factors – power, money, ambition. It's an attraction that manifests in jealousy and violence rather than kindness and generosity. We can see a legacy of homophobia within these coded narratives, the idea that there cannot be something as simple as romantic love between two men or two women, that there must be ulterior motives, past traumas, worldwide recruitment conspiracies, perhaps the desperate assertion that there must be something different about queer love, because otherwise society had denied queer relationships and individuals equality and respect for absolutely nothing. We see this impulse too in the second queer villain trope I want to use in this introductory section of the video, queer as monstrous. The queer monster and the monstrous queer are two sides of the same coin that we've seen perpetuated, whether overtly or not, across our screens for decades. The queer villain by their own villainy is monstrous, not quite normal enough to be human, but they are themselves also often literal monsters, vampires, witches, succubus, aliens and more. Even the idea of a monster in the closet has strong queer connotations. Starting in the 1930s, the motion picture producers and distributors of America established the Hays Code. If you've watched some of my other videos or any other videos on YouTube that cover queer history, you've almost certainly heard of this before. So here is the briefest of introductions for those not in the know. The Hays Code was a moral censorship guide imposed on Hollywood by itself to try and avoid governmental censorship. It was concerned with restricting profanity, nudity, violence and sexual perversions amongst other indecent topics from being portrayed on film. Anything deemed sinful or in violation of natural law either wouldn't be portrayed at all or couldn't be portrayed positively. Therefore, queer themes or characteristics were by necessity either not present at all or were relegated to evil sin-doers, which resulted in decades of queer-coded villains gracing our screens. The end of the code in the 60s technically released filmmakers from these rules, but queer coding, especially of villains, persists today. I myself made a video years ago about the way that Disney's villains fall in this history, and there are plenty of people writing about these children's characters specifically, so you should definitely check those if you are, haven't already and you are interested. In his book Monsters in the Closet, Homosexuality and the Horror Film, Dr. Harry N. Benshoff explores the social conditions that created classic film monsters, specifically looking at horror through a queer lens. While straight participants in such experiences usually return to their daylight worlds, both the monster and the homosexual are permanent residents of shadowy spaces, at worst caves, castles and closets, and at best a marginalised and oppressed position within the cultural hegemony. Queer viewers are thus more likely than straight ones to experience the monster's plight in more personal, individualised terms. But this critique doesn't just apply to the horror genre. 
The monsterization of queer villains happens across all genres. You have the aforementioned Disney villains, from Hercules as Hades, to Scar and the Lion King, to The Little Mermaid's Ursula, already separated physically from mainstream communities within their respective worlds. Hades in the underworld, Scar as a second son in the royal lines, skulking in his own cave without a lioness mate, and Ursula, banished from Triton's kingdom. They're othered even more by their queer-coded mannerisms and looks, especially in the ways they contrast with the heterosexual heroes in their stories. And then there are the countless villains in older media, including Jennifer in Jennifer's Body, Xerxes from 300, or even Jared from Labyrinth. These are often human-adjacent villains whose queerness simmers under the surface, either as a tantalising tease or a violent threat. These characters often evoke the viewer's dual feelings of transgressive attraction and moral repulsion. One such beloved but monstrous character character is Lestat de Lyoncourt from Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire. Since their first depictions, vampires have been symbols of insatiable deviant hunger, life-altering infection, and undiscriminating predation. In the 2022 TV adaptation, Lestat as vampire already poses a threat. He is essentially immortal, possesses heightened senses and strength, as well as unique magical powers like flight and mind control, and is a violent predator who feeds on humans. This alone would be enough to make him a villainous monster, but added to that is Lestat's bisexuality, which is depicted literally and figuratively with his character. He sleeps with, feeds on, and turns into vampires, men, women, and horrifyingly children alike. His monstrosity, like his sexuality, does not fit into a clean binary, both symbolise his otherness from society. Fear around vampirism echoes long-standing toxic fears around the queer community, of various levels of contagion, from fear during the AIDS epidemic, to the fear that even learning about queer theory and LGBTQ plus history in schools will turn kids gay. While queer-coded villains that have come out of film history are often stereotyped and sometimes frankly offensive in their portrayals of queerness, Many people in the queer community have embraced them, as well as explicitly out monstrous queers, despite their villainy. If these are the bad guys, the figures we're not meant to root for, then why are many so beloved in the LGBTQ plus community? The answers are not so easy, because the question, what is a villain, isn't an easy one to answer either. If there are two sides to every story, then is the villain just the person not getting to tell theirs? When is a villain relatable and reclaimable, and when are they beyond redemption? And if we are truly living through the death of media literacy and a renewed moral policing of fictional stories, how can we trust people to tell the difference? To start to answer this, we need to question the premise of villainy altogether, and first look at how society has defined villainous behaviour. Questioning the premise. Queer people simply living their lives, being themselves and loving who they love, has itself been seen as villainous behaviour through history and across the world. To be queer was to be a criminal, and for many people it still is. What were the Stonewall riots if not a mob of criminally violent queers? They might be praised now as immortalised activists fighting for what is right, but that is an incredibly recent development in historical optics. The dichotomy between good and bad is often about which side you're standing on, or whose voice is prioritised. Jordan Shawcrow, in his book Murder Most Queer, looks at how the cultural imagination defies queer villainy. It should come as no surprise that the political realities surrounding same-sex relations influence the depiction of queer people within our cultural narratives. Such representations have long served to reaffirm the ideologies that criminalise the queer in the American imagination. A society's moral and social ideologies have always influenced how groups, experiences and identities are depicted in art, and it's no exception for fictional villains. However, not all villains are created equal. There are numerous characterizations and behaviours that fall under the umbrella of queer villainy, from the blatantly heinous to the surprisingly heroic. When we talk about queer villains, the breadth of what we are talking about has to be taken into account and examined with more nuance. At this point it feels like a particularly fitting moment to thank today's sponsor, supporter of Sexy Queers Everywhere, with a quick ad from Lilo. Obviously as someone with an unusual amount of sex education to friends, I already knew about Lilo and had heard great things when they approached me to collaborate, and I knew that a lot of people in my audience use sex toys, but I am the type of asexual who does not. So I asked if instead of me trying them out, I could send them to a friend, thinking that the friend would give them a try and then send over a few sentences about their experiences that I could pass on to you lovely people. Instead, I got 
This screenshot sent to me, which honestly feels like it gets across the vibe, pun fully intended, more than an official wordy write-up from her. So what exactly was going on there? Well, this is the Enigma Wave, not hers, I have another one. It's designed for those who have a clitoris and a vagina with an insertable tail that vibrates or moves for a finger-like motion against your G-spot, plus pulses stimulating your entire clitoral area. It brings triple stimulation that caters to different erogenous zones for a satisfying blended orgasm. Lilo says it might be for those that want to experiment with new experiences and methods of pleasure. It gives you control over eight intensity settings with a silicon material designed to deliver gentle sonic waves so you can figure out what works best for you or your partner. And Lilo is hosting a massive giveaway for new newsletter subscribers with a thousand toys up for grabs. So for your chance to win one or enjoy an exclusive discount, then follow the link in the description and subscribe now. Okay, back to the video and a topic that is the antithesis of what we have just discussed. The sadist. Over the centuries, we as humans have labelled certain behaviours as evil, taboo or criminal because they're deemed morally reprehensible and or cause irrevocable harm. I think if you were to ask people if something that causes that kind of harm is bad, then most people would agree, yes, it feels like an objective, broadly agreeable idea of morality regardless of religion or cultural background. However, queerness itself has often been categorised this way. As Shalkraut in his book explains, the homophobic imagination equates murderous desire with homosexual desire, viewing it as physical lust, removed from the romantic or social ideals attributed to heterosexuality. Both homosexual and murderous lusts are imagined as abnormal, unhealthy, monstrous desires that exist because of a lack of proper morality. It's important to note that this homophobic imagination was both created by and responsible for enforcing illegal and cultural landscape where queer people did not have access to legitimised forms of romance. They couldn't cohabit without suspicion, they couldn't get married, they couldn't raise a family together. It was a cycle, right, to say that gay people are all obsessed with sex, that they have no real love between them, but you also deny them the ability to demonstrate that love in a real way. Across the seven seasons of Outlander, a drama about a World War II nurse who time travels back to 1740s Scotland, I know, don't question it, perhaps the most loathed character amongst the show's many villains is Captain Jonathan Randall. As a British captain in an occupied Scotland, Randall radiates pure villainy. He shows little to no redeeming qualities, offers no sympathetic backstory to why he acts the way he does and appears purely to have been driven by rage and violent pleasure and worst of all his villainy is compounded by the fact that he will rape torture and murder men and women alike an equal opportunity monster randall makes his monstrous mark on season one by sexually assaulting both of the show's protagonists claire and jamie randall's queerness is a weapon that he wields indiscriminately no one is safe it perfectly correlates that he's not just a sadistic person but also holds a powerful position as a member of a colonizing military force. The queer figure is not just a danger to the individual, the men or women who might be their victims, but also a danger to society at large, because their existence contradicts the supposed truths about what is natural and right. And so here we see this twisting of a homophobic rhetoric of queer danger to create a monstrous rapist colonial figurehead. He is a monster against which our two culturally opposed heroes, English Claire and Scottish Jamie, can feel equally threatened, and it is by standing up to his reign of terror that the two come together eventually falling in love. By opposing Randall's villainy, they are essentially fighting to maintain the political and social beliefs of the 1740s Scotland, while also solidifying their own relationship and sexual identities, which are heterosexual and monogamous, even across time and space. Similar intersections can be seen, again, in Lestat from Interview with the Vampire. While in the book, both are both white and bisexual, Louis is depicted as a gay black man in the TV adaptation, while Lestat retains his white bi identity. Lestat is presented as protagonist Louis's vampire vampire teacher and lover, but he falls more easily into the role of villain. The stat is possessive, hypocritical, hedonistic and violent. He leaves Louis for tryst with lovers of varying genders, and although he claims Louis can do the same, he becomes suspicious and jealous when Louis takes him up on the offer. While a stat could eat animals, he chooses to hunt humans, sadistically drawing out their deaths and feeding as much of their terror as their blood. But by making Lestat the only bi-vampire in the show, his moral depravity can be seen as in some way linked to an assumed sexual depravity too, specifically a voracious appetite that separates his bisexual nature from either straight or gay counterparts. Unlike Randall, there is a vulnerability in and understanding of Lestat's backstory that contextualises his behaviour, though doesn't excuse it. We see his traumatic past and feel how much he yearns for family and love. 
It's not difficult to see the parallels between his existence as a vampire and the isolation and threat many members of the queer community feel, whereas the initial seasons of Outlander had no sympathetic or heroic queer heroes at all, Interview the Vampire does give us another lead who fulfills this protagonist role in Louis. By turning Louis into a vampire in a burning church surrounded by murdered priests no less, Lestat separates Louis from everything considered good and right, but specifically from his heteronormative family. This makes Louis's very presence in the form of domestic space one of danger and taboo, perfectly evidenced in the scene where Louis struggles not to give in to his vampiric hunger and feed on his newborn nephew. In place of this human family, Lestat creates a new family with Louis and vampire child Claudia. Thanks to Lestat's infection, Louis and Claudia are cut off from their human lives, once dictated by heteronormative and moral values, and forced to conform to the subversive rules of this new family's lifestyle. Lestat's vampirism is not just one that infects the body, but one that infects the cultural and social paradigm as well. Considering that Lestat is white and Louis and Claudia are not, Lestat's actions also carry a racialized violence, especially poignant in the show's setting of 1900s New Orleans. There are two interesting opposing readings of this balance. Either the presence of another LGBTQ plus character counters the potential harm of Lestat's depravity by giving audiences the understanding that this is not meant to be a reflection of his sexuality specifically. However, one could also argue that, with no other depictions of bisexuality on the show, the stats promiscuity, recklessness, possessiveness, and blatant disregard for the well-being of humans and vampires alike becomes one and the same with his specific sexual identity and its stereotypes. Bisexuality in particular is traditionally stereotyped as being an orientation that is a phase that makes one greedy or insatiable or which is untrustworthy in some way. The bisexual is doing it for attention if they are a woman or in denial if they are a man. As Linda D. Wayne points out in her essay Bisexuality and Agency, it is often portrayed problematically as the idealistic best of both worlds, as well as threateningly faithful to neither world. A research article snappily named Attitudes Towards Bisexual Men and Women Amongst a Nationally Representative Probability Sample of Adults in the United States by Dodge et al. is just one of a number of papers and studies that show biphobic attitudes present amongst not just heterosexual populations, but within the rest of the queer community as well. And of course, each identity in the queer community comes with its own specific stereotypes and social perceptions. And then we also have the question of how villainous Claudia and Louis are. Their nature is one of death. Is this a love the sinner, hate the sin kind of a deal? Do we take into account the level of control these characters have over their actions with such strong biological urges? Are they exempt from judgment due to their inability to escape it? Lestat revels in pain and suffering. Is that revelry something that makes him worse than another vampire who kills and feeds from just as many humans but doesn't enjoy it? Is the deviance itself enough? Deviance. It is most basic definition, deviance is anything that departs from the accepted norms of society. The term, however, has been strongly associated with sexuality and gender identity across the years, with those in the LGBTQ plus community being labelled as deviant or having deviant desires. This is seen often in the queer coded villain trope, in their inability to conform to the rules and social norms of society, especially through their behaviours, mannerisms and dress. Take for instance the character of Ursula from The Little Mermaid, who differs greatly from her undersea community. She is fat, has a deep voice, lives alone in a dark cave, practices witchcraft, craft of a sort and is an octopus human hybrid as opposed to the fish human mermaids. Writers have long relied on these kinds of stereotype shortcuts to emphasise sinisterness, otherness and danger within a character, much like scars or disfigurement have been used to suggest villainy. Does that sound like another queer coded Disney villain to you? Few queer characters have so complicated the line between hero and villain and deviance and freedom like Dr. Frankenfurter from the cult classic The Rocky Horror Picture Show. The plot follows hapless couple Janet and Brad as they seek shelter in an old castle one evening, home of Dr. Frankenfurter, a self-proclaimed sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. What ensues is a night of medical mayhem, murder, and sexual promiscuity. Over the course of the evening, Dr. Frankenfurter has sex with both Janet and Brad, and does so by tricking them into thinking that they are being seduced by their spouse. He uses his scientific prowess to create himself the perfect lover, and exhibits murderous jealousy over his creation. He flaunts and at times weaponizes his gender-defying physicality and style. Most notably, by the end of the film, he has inspired, or corrupted, the conservative traditional couple to be more like him, 
They all performed the film's final number in black corsets, fishnet tights and heels. In Murder Most Queer, Jordan Schildkraut unpacks the sexual deviance of the infamous Doctor. Dressed like a vampire dominatrix, Frankenfurter is a pansexual menace who must be, and is, stopped, but he is also a prophet of sexual liberation, urging the audience, don't dream it, be it. A call that was taken up by a generation of fans who repeatedly came to screenings of the film version dressed as their favourite characters, performing floor shows and interacting with the characters on screen, merging cinema with live performance and making the audience's theatrical outrageousness part of their sexual liberation. At times, Frank Converter's sexuality is a weapon, at others it's a source of joy and freedom. He is both an inspiration and liberator as well as a possessive tyrant, and while his deviancy from the norm can be enjoyed by the characters and audiences alike, his actions ultimately can't be condoned, as evidenced by his demise at the film's end. The fact that the film has been labelled a cult classic and has found its most devout audiences through midnight showings and independent theatres speaks to its place in the shadow space for the nonconformists. This embodiment and reenactment creates a cyclical birth-death rebirth of Frankenverter, his actions and his message. The repeated performance allows queer people the freedom to embrace or redefine deviance as the norm. Meanwhile, non-queer attendees can dabble in said deviance, one that has subsequently been been commercialised for safe mainstream consumption before going back to their heteronormative lives. But the scope of so-called villainous behaviours goes beyond the sadistic or deliberately subversive. Some are tied inextricably to marginalised people's experience and existence in the world. Trans deceit. When it comes to marginalised groups, the idea of villainy as inherent to their marginalisation has been used over the years to justify their mistreatment and strengthen negative stereotypes. The fear of trans people, especially trans women, is often tied to an idea of deceitfulness, social transgression and aggressive sexuality. And so we see the archetype of the trans villainess as either a passing trans woman whose true gender is revealed by the end of the story, or else as a delusional man in a dress driven to gender bending madness by some Freudian perversion. In this way, trans women are damned no matter what they do. If they try to pass and mould themselves into the ideal embodiment of cis womanhood, then they are liars. If they make no effort, then they are, well, also still liars. Consider Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs or Bobby in Dress to Kill or Norman Bates in Psycho. It doesn't matter whether or not these characters are trans in the reality of their stories, they are connected to the transphobic imagery of trans women that exists in our reality. The idea that there is something psychologically wrong with trans women by their very nature, that they in fact go against nature, that if they are willing to break away from the fundamental gender binary foundation of Western patriarchal life, what else might they be capable of? Gender nonconformity is monstrous and so to add this to your villains is to heighten their sinister nature. One of the most infamous examples of the trans villain, however, is not tied to the extremes of horror, but in many ways it makes it even more insidious. The 1994 comedy film Ace Ventura Pet Detective is remembered vaguely but fondly by many people my age. It stars Jim Carrey as a titular animal detective and includes his signature rubber-faced hijinks. But a moment many people blocked out of their memory of the film comes in the form of a forced outing of Detective Einhorn in the climactic moments of the movie as the villain in disguise to prove that she is in fact ex-footballer Ray Finkel. The scene is surprisingly explicit for a children's movie, with Ventura pulling off Einhorn's blouse to expose her breasts covered only by her bra, and ripping her skirt to reveal her underwear to a gathered audience of police officers. The proof of her true identity comes when one officer spots evidence that Einhorn is tucking in her underwear, and Ventura spins her around to show the gathered men the evidence for himself in vindication, dramatically proclaiming that Einhorn killed the victim whose death he has been investigating because he found Captain Winky, creating a kind of reverse accusation of the gay trans panic defence. This legal defence is defined by the LGBT bar as a legal strategy which asks the jury to find that a victim's sexual orientation or gender identity is to blame for the defendant's violent reaction, including murder, including where the provocation defence argues that the victim's proposition of a non-violent sexual advantage could be sufficiently provocative to induce the defendant to kill them. This moment is played as a comedic bit in the movie, with the officers and Ventura himself spitting and gagging in disgust, with the implication that Einhorn has seduced them all at various points, and they are sickened by the very idea now that they know that Einhorn is really a man. Add to that the fact that Einhorn sounds like the name that J.K. Rowling would give her token trans character, and the bit is complete. 
Yet it isn't just harmful stereotypes that connect queer characters with the role of the villain. In fact, sometimes it can give a compelling connection between the two that exposes queer suffering and resilience rather than damning or ignoring it. Self-preservation. Take Oscar-nominated animated movie Nimona, for example, an adaptation of a graphic novel of the same name written by J.D. Stevenson. The story is set in a science fantasy alternate world, with modern technology running alongside medieval tropes like knights and kingdoms. The titular character Nimona is eager to act as a sidekick to the new villain on the block, Ballister. Ballister, however, was framed, and his fall from grace as a knight of the realm is less the story of a true villain reveling in wrongdoing and more of a hapless innocent tarred with an evil brush. Nimona, however, is convinced of his villainous spirit and sees a connection between their circumstances that earns him her loyalty. His downfall was orchestrated by those who wanted to stop the rise of a commoner to the ranks of knight, and that prejudice is something that Nimona sees reflected in her own existence as a shapeshifter who was vilified for her powers. Nimona is a villain in the world of this story, a literal monster who the knights have been charged with defending the city from in the first place. Her very existence goes against the structures and foundations of her society, and it is that fear and hatred that has driven her to the outskirts of that society which I think sounds familiar to many queer people. When I first watched this movie, it was unmistakably a queer allegory to me, especially when we consider Nimona's shape-shifting powers specifically, the fluidity of her identity, her body, her gender. We see explicit conversations about her identity in the movie, especially between Nimona and Ballister, who initially complains about Nimona being too much, bulking at her unashamed shifting. At one point he asks her, can you please just be normal for a second? And we see her challenge the very premise of this question, normal. I just think it'd be easier if you were a girl. Easier to be a girl? You're hilarious. I mean, easier if you looked human. Easier for who? For you, other people aren't as accepting as me. More than just something to oppose society on principle, Nimona's shifting is an integral part of her and her ability to experience life as her true self. When he asks her if she can just not shift, she replies, Honestly, I feel worse when I don't do it. Like my inside's itchy. You know, like that second right before you sneeze. That's close to it. Then I shapeshift and I'm free. I wouldn't die die, I just sure wouldn't be living. At this point, we understand both Nimona and Ballister's villainy as something socially constructed, in the way that much criminality in our own world is defined by the state and is often created or exacerbated by it. If we live in a society where being gay itself is criminalized, then gay people are by default criminals regardless of any objective truth. Yet the movie goes one step further, not simply leaving the question of villainy and monstrosity as a clear-cut lie by a corrupt leadership. Instead, we discover that Nimona is quite literally the great black monster from legend, supposedly an evil defeated by mythic heroine Glorith. It is revealed that Nimona and Glorith had been friends, but when her village discovered the shifting creature in their midst, they drove her out, inadvertently setting their own settlement ablaze in the frenzy. We see Nimona change into various animals in panic, including predators snarling at the villagers, and the mistrust that Glorith now has towards her after seeing her supposedly true nature. This idea that even in the face of prejudice and violence, a marginalized person must be placid and accepting, lest they prove the prejudice itself correct, is an insidious cycle. Glorith in that moment seems unable to understand the instincts or reasoning that led Nimona to shift in self-defense and anger. Instead, she sees what her parents warned her about, her new friend, something that was dangerous. The finale of Nimona is not about knights valiantly slaying a monster. It's about a monster traumatized and unable to see a way to exist in a society hostile to her very existence, that sees no way out but to remove herself from life itself. Nimona transforms into the great black monster and walks through the city determined to impale herself on the sword of the enormous statue of Glorith at its center. Once again, the human settlement alights, but those explosions are of the knights making as they run to destroy this monster in their midst, even as their efforts threaten to hurt innocent bystanders. At this point in the film, we don't actually know Nimona's intentions, instead knowing only that this is a supposed monster attack. But even so, her actions feel justified and validated by the narrative. Why shouldn't she come after those in power who exiled her? Who can blame her for the roiling uncontrollable fear and pain of being betrayed once more by someone she thought she could trust? Just as queerness has often been subject to the debate of nature versus nurture, Nimona asks, are monsters born or made? And if they're made, who is responsible for the havoc that they wreck? Her pain is given value by the filmmakers, and the lines of villain and monster stay blurred, asking us to question who draws those lines in the first place. In the end, what brings Nimona back from the brink of suicide is Ballister's words as he reaches out to stop her. I'm sorry. I see you, Nimona.
and you're not alone. That validation, that apology, the understanding of how traumatized and wounded she is, how lonely and frightening it is to feel alone in your internal experiences of the world and yourself, it mirrors the positive effects of affirming environments and support systems in our own world for queer people, and especially queer youth. We needed Nimona to be considered a villain for this narrative to work. We needed to see how her marginalization had warped her sense of self. We needed to understand that nothing about that label is so simple. In this way, we can see both the subjectivity of villainous behaviours, but also the value in queer villains themselves when they are rooted in specifics of the queer experience rather than outdated queer coding. Narrative framing. In some cases, the actions of characters are removed from traditional moral rules altogether, especially when it comes to the designation of protagonist versus antagonist, or the comparative transgressions of the two, complicating the definition of a villain further. Take recent queer TV sensation Has Been Hotel, an adult cartoon series which takes place in hell. Almost every character in the show is literally in hell. They are sinners condemned or demons who were born to the underworld or they are literally Lucifer himself. The characters fight full scale wars and kill casually on screen in the show. Actions that in reality I'd say are pretty frowned upon and seen as villainous. Yet the idea of exactly who is a villain in the show is a key thematic question, with the angels inhabiting heaven ironically fulfilling that role the most. They make a deadly annual pilgrimage to hell in order to cull sinners and keep the population under control. They too are engaging in war and death, yet we see them as the bad guys, because they are going to war against our lead characters, whose point of view we occupy. In the show, quite literally 80% of hell seems to be queer, whereas Heaven has no canonically queer characters at all that I could find. And on the surface, this fact alone might point to some anti-LGBTQ plus bias, but the whole idea of the show is that who exactly ends up being labelled as a sinner is something that no one, even Heaven, seems to know. Does it depend on the widely accepted moral consensus at the time of the person's life and death? Is it to do with legal criminality? Does it take circumstance into account? In this way, it would be easy to see why so much of hell is occupied by queer people whose very existence has been criminalised for centuries. They had a guaranteed ticket downside if human laws and morals were taken into account. The show also asks us to question the moral judgement of characters whose moral code involves primarily harm to themselves. Angel Dust, a sinner who works in hell as a porn star and whose soul is owned by one of the powerful overlords, Valentino, is the embodiment of moral depravity by many social standards. He's an addict who swears like a sailor and flirts indiscriminately with anyone and anything in his path. He performs any number of taboo sex acts, positions and fantasies on camera and seems proud of it. He will be set up in other settings and narratives as someone inherently indecent, selfish, weak, giving into base impulses, exploiting his own body for drugs and money. Someone to be judged. Or at most simply pitied. However, Has Been Hotel doesn't let us simplify Angel Dust in this way, revealing Angel's mistreatment at the hands of Valentino, but also the ways he's had to adapt to survive the abuse, to soothe Val's ego, to endure his demands, to crave the drugs that take his mind away from his body. Angel doesn't stay boxed into the archetype of the perfect victim, with his hypersexualization, his anger, his relapses, and the way he doesn't start his story at a point where he is ready to try and leave Valentino. Similarly, in the Has Been Hotel companion show set in the same universe that airs on YouTube called Hell of a Boss, we have a lead ensemble of characters whose entire job is to go to Earth and assassinate living human beings on behalf of their dead patrons who want revenge. They are mass murderers for profit. Blitz in particular is abrasive, rude, insulting, a clear profile of a villain. Yet the tone and genre of the show allows more depth. We see his backstory, his self-hatred, his humour, his deep love of his adopted daughter, his regrets and gradually his slow growth. He's a villain as a standalone character but becomes something less certain in the context of this show. And we'll be coming back to the implications of this with his character a little later in the video. Homophobia is the villain actually. In the most literal sense, it's homophobia that helped bring about the Hays Code, that in turn helped establish queer-coded stereotypes and archetypes, with the beloved or reviled, which is still used today in all sorts of ways, from the comic relief to the villain. These tropes in turn have been used against queer people in real life, as jokes or accusations or excuses or labels or weapons. Ultimately, it's left queer people with two options. One, work within the legacy homophobia has imposed onto the role queer identity plays within real and imagined narratives, with our creative self-expression and basic rights being dictated by suspicion, accusation, and the whims of the heteronormative majority. Or option two, fight back and risk being the villain yourself. 
maybe through participating in activism ahead of your time or exploring complex queer characters who stray from respectable actions in your writing or just existing without apology. Earlier on I asked the question, why have villains, especially queer and queer coded ones, been so embraced by the queer community? And part of the answer definitely lies, I think, in the understanding that often the queer character isn't actually the real villain. Freedom from fear is a privilege, one afforded to the rich, the white, the straight, the cis, the male population. The more your identity differs from this, for the most part, the more the world around you becomes a harder, scarier and more unjust place to live in. And so if you're constantly fighting for your personhood, your basic human rights, your agency, and consistently being met with resistance at best and fatal violence at worst, what other options are there than self-defense, even if that self-defense might be, under different circumstances, deemed criminal or villainous? If we look back at Nimona, we see the shapeshifter attempt to find connection and acceptance within a human community. She does this in ways that are friendly, open and well-intended. When she's met with violence, fear and prejudice again and again, she's forced to act with reciprocal violence against others and herself. But her actions are considered attacks and the actions of the greater population are considered self-defense because she is the one differing from the norm. Her story perfectly showcases subjective morality. Who tells the story gets to define who the hero is and who the villain is. The scroll depicting heroic Glorith defeating a horrible monster is the narrative that the film's characters have been told. But the film itself is narrated by Nimona who reclaims her story and by the end becomes defined as the hero. If we take queer villains and look at both the world of the film and the context in which the film was made, their villainy is not so black and white. We begin to see how much of a mess heteronormativity can make of people's sense of self and self-worth, how villainous actions can be vindicated, how violence can be cyclical and sometimes, after years of being told to turn the other cheek, to bullies and bigots, the only response is to say, well, fuck that. Breaking down the dichotomies. To my mind, an exploration of queer villains doesn't stop at a simple question of whether we should have more queer villains or fewer. Instead, it leads to the inevitable questioning of what is considered villainy at all, and how this false dichotomy itself can be just as damaging as an individual depraved bisexual or predatory lesbian character. The very expectation of a hero and a villain sets up an opposition between supposed good and evil, a character whose actions are, if not wholly good, at least justified in the name of righteousness or justice or morality. They may stumble, even fall, but they are at heart a good person. Through film history, this good person has overwhelmingly been straight and cis, and sure, a lot of villains have been too, but not because of their straight cisness. This simplistic character structure, which guides the audience on a kind of moral journey, where one is expected to rally around the hero and sympathise with them most of all, while vilifying the villain by keeping us from their point of view, plays right into the kind of outsider moral panic we see across history, and still today. And I also think this is an element of the death of media literacy that is so part of current discourse. The idea that people increasingly need narratives and characters spelled out for them, but also that there is a lack of ability to discern reliable or accurate media or to apply critical thinking to its messaging and narratives. If you're looking at the most simplistic version of any story, then there is something appealing about the good versus evil dichotomy. Even with morally grey characters, there is seemingly this desire across much of the internet to flatten them into one judgement or the other, that they must either be totally exonerated of their past crimes or else be damned for ever more by them. And there's also a kind of idea that if you simply dislike a character, there has to be a moral reasoning for it. That seems to be extending into people in real life too. That if there is someone that you know that you dislike, there has to be some kind of moral justification for it. Remember that triangle that I talked about in the introduction of this video? We can see how an absence of media literacy, a dogmatic focus on preserving moral purity, and the existence of complex marginalised characters and stories can combine to worrying results. I was thinking about my own experience over the week I've been writing this video script. My For You page on TikTok is very unsurprisingly full of edits of Blitz and Stolas, two of the characters from Hell of a Boss that I mentioned earlier, because I've recently become a big fan of the show. They are in a complicated, messy, sexual and potentially romantic relationship. What surprised me, however, although maybe it shouldn't, were the comments. I expected people gushing over the edits or theorising about upcoming episodes or asking where a specific clip was from. Instead, it was full of people debating which of the two was the villain in the relationship, which was the bad guy. The context of self-doubt and classism and trauma was missing entirely, even though it is so present in the show. But so is the idea that two characters, two people even, could be in a mess of a relationship and they didn't have to be a clear-cut line of fault and blame. They didn't have to be the toxic one and the victim. Knowledge that they had as omniscient audience members, which the characters lacked, was brought in as evidence of their callous treatment of each other. 
The comments were split 50-50 trying to decry one or the other as being the queer villain in question. When it comes to queer characters, there is of course the added layer of historical criminalization, the ways that our identity and morality have been so publicly entwined, and we see this in the moral panic around things happening in the community right now. The trans schools guidance in the UK, the NHS blocking access to hormones for trans youth, the protests against LGBTQ plus books in schools and libraries. In the article, Puritanism took over online fandom and then came for the rest of the internet, Internet, writer Aja Romano, who I've referenced a few times on this channel, I just realised, um, talks about the rise of so-called puritines, young people with extremely conservative ideas about sex. But they're also quick to point out that this isn't a solely youth-based phenomenon, but one which has been increasingly seen across all ages in fandom spaces, explaining, this trend would be bad news in any online community, but it's been especially heady and unwieldy in fandom, an entire culture built around feeling things strongly, not rationally. The result is one of the unlikeliest fronts of the culture war, an internet community, once the bastion of delightful deviance and subversion, being completely overtaken by a new form of purity culture, often spearheaded by people who would otherwise describe themselves as politically liberal. It's this kind of attitude they describe of people who don't just see the potential impact that fiction can have, but conflate fictional harm with real world harm in a one-to-one -one comparison that led to the kind of comments I was seeing on TikTok and beyond. It wasn't just that either Blitz or Stolas the characters had made mistakes in the narrative, it was that either Blitz or Stolas were causing literal real world harm in some way that transcended their lack of physical existence. And not just the characters, but those that liked them too. The idea that if you liked a problematic fictional character, you were no better than them. The idea that you are what you consume. Hell of a Boss didn't even need to create queer villains. The viewers did it for them. So how do we respond to this cultural and social policing? One such response we've seen through the history of marginalized communities entering into the mainstream is the use of respectability politics. This is a way that those within a marginalized group may attempt to gain social standing and respect by distancing themselves from the undesirable attributes of their community, rejecting those that give them a bad name, aiming to win acceptance from the non-marginalized group by proving that they are the good gay or trans or black or Muslim or working class person. This has the twin effects of further demonising those who can't or won't assimilate with the mainstream, but also validating said mainstream in their negative treatment of those people. Yet when we ask queer characters to be perfect, lest they be perceived as the villain, we reveal the narrowness of respectability. In some ways this ask can be criticised simply because the resulting characters would be boring, skating around the character growth and struggles that make for the most compelling stories. But it's also a cowardly retreat into throwing your fellow queers under the bus for the sake of your own comfort. Queer characters, queer people, have been deemed criminals through history and across the world for simply being themselves. We've been labelled groomers and paedophiles for simply working as teachers or youth workers. We've been accused of destroying the very fabric of society just by getting married. To simper at the feet of those who would condemn us, or pointing to our most vulnerable as collateral damage in queerness's good name, is what real villainy looks like. By condemning all queer and queer-coded villains, you're also condemning the queer people who sympathise with them, who embody the traits that have been villainized: The fat queers, the ugly queers, the slutty queers, the dirty queers, the poor queers, the mentally ill queers, the sissy queers and the butch queers. But it also cuts off our ability to explore themes within the queer community which do speak to behaviour that is abusive or toxic or in other ways messes with the perfect image we need to project to be respected by many in the mainstream. When marriage equality was being debated, we had to trot out the most middle-class, wholesome, white, monogamous couples to fight for equal rights, but we also had to push aside conversations around domestic violence, manipulation or assault within the community, lest we all be tarred with that brush. One story of a heterosexual couple abusing their child is a tragedy, but one story of a lesbian couple doing the same is also a reason that those people shouldn't have been allowed to have children in the first place, that this just shows that children need a mummy and a daddy, that there is something inherently sinister about queer people around children, and so on and so on. Acknowledging the potential consequences of representation that feeds into harmful stereotypes, that perpetuates the image of lesbians as sexual predators or trans women as deceitful aggressors, does not mean that lesbian or trans characters can never be those things, but that a complex exploration of our community expands beyond this, and that there has to be an understanding from audiences of the limits of singular strands of representation as reflections of entire communities. And queer characters also shouldn't need to pass some moral justification test to exist in the first place. They shouldn't need to be a literal representation of real queer people or do something positive for the community. They should be allowed to be 
bad people, mean people, cathartic explorations of queer writers' fears as well as their hopes. They should be allowed to be campy or serious, fun or frightening. Because queer rage, queer anger, queer pain is very real. And villains that engage with this as a form of reckoning have, I think, not been pushed far enough. Are they justified? We already see justified anger and vengeance in other cinematic genres, from the rape revenge narratives to the use of fridging, when a female character is killed to motivate a male protagonist hero's arc. These characters are at most seen as morally grey or anti-heroes, yet the same doesn't seem to have been extended to queer characters for the most part, especially not in mainstream movies. A few anti-heroes might be incidentally queer, think Loki or Deadpool, but their anger and drive doesn't come from that queerness. Queer activists get their moment in the mainstream once the focus of the activism has already become socially acceptable. A furious fight for marriage equality, or for HIV to be taken seriously by the government, or for traumatising conversion camps to be shut down, is okay in these leads so long as it is a historical biopic or rousing retrospective documentary. But when we look at queer activist characters as a general rule, they are a warning. They are the counter to the respectable gay character within a movie or show. They are too much, too loud, too queer. They teach us that it is gauche and bullish to fight for our rights, that anger and violence will solve nothing. I made an entire video essay about the queer activist character that digs into this in much more detail if you want to go and watch that. But when it comes to queer villains, to my mind, we haven't yet seen enough villainy at the hands of queer characters looking to enact righteous revenge on a homophobic and transphobic world. These villains maybe haven't been pushed far enough. The genuinely interesting queer villain who's angry about their specific treatment for being queer. Because often we see homophobic characters on screen as exaggerated versions of homophobia, or else they're closeted themselves themselves. They're an extreme case that makes heterosexual and cis audiences feel validated in themselves as good people because they aren't that bad. In the same way racist antagonists so often use slurs in every other sentence and tell people to go back where you came from, or sexist characters who end up being wife-beating assholes who catcall every woman who walks past. In reality, some of the most insidious and dangerous prejudice is much more subtle, but displaying that within an antagonist would arguably make white and male audiences too uncomfortable comfortable because they would see themselves in this prejudiced villain without being able to see themselves in the marginalised hero. The more justified a villain becomes in their villainous behaviour, the less the villain seems like a villain in the clear-cut binary of good versus evil that is easily consumable by audiences. And if the villain becomes the hero, if we see their actions as justified or gallant or understandable, then conversely the hero starts to become the villain within this binary. It invites the audience to question who they align with, but as we've seen, not all audiences will take up that invitation. If people are doing media literacy right, then that's where the conclusion or the specific lack of one comes in. But that isn't something we can assume will happen. It's the reason why so many people go feral over the Hunger Games and the Three Finger Salute and the I Am A Mockingjay books and movies, where an oppressed teenager rises up violently against the child-killing state which has been terrorising her and her people. Characters in that series can do morally wrong actions, lie, steal, kill even, but the audience is led to see them as sympathetic heroes because we understand the power dynamics at play, the dystopian injustice. Yet these same fans can be completely unable to extend that same reading to reality, can look at a genocide against the children of Gaza or the wealth inequality in their own nation and feel that the smallest protest that even inconveniences the general public a tiny amount is wrong. Remember earlier in the video when I was talking about irrevocable harm being what many people consider to be evil, but understanding that queerness was once seen that way and still is by some? The opposite is also true. Many elements of our society, capitalism, wealth inequality, inhumane supply chains, undeniably do irrevocable harm, yet so many people don't feel confident in labelling them as evil. And maybe that's part of why we have this moral purity push right now. It's easier to exert your moral superiority over individuals than it is to fight the wider systems, and maybe even admit your own complicity in them. This kind of justice is seen across the political spectrum, but increasingly I see it in supposedly progressive spaces. People who claim to strive for freedom and equality. It's this kind of absolutist stance that, to me, smacks of activism divorced from empathy. A version of leftist politics devoid of care and curiosity and community that should be its foundation to my mind. Because ultimately, having these narratives where evil is defeated by a goodly hero, where that clear-cut divide is a source of accomplishment, feels like an obvious parallel. Because to many of these people, it feels like they see defeating the people who write or consume morally complex, experimental, or otherwise problematic media as a similarly heroic act, 
in itself. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and if you have any thoughts about this, you know, villainous soup of a video and anything I covered in it, then please leave them in the comments below. I'll also leave a link to my Patreon if you want to support me and videos like this one in the future. There are a bunch of perks there you can check out, including things like recommendation lists, where I go through the things that month that I've been watching or listening to or reading that I think you should check out, along with sometimes I do like live reactions, we do patron only streams, just a bunch of fun things. So if you are maybe a little bit curious then check out the link i will also leave links to my social media so you can find me all over the internet and until i see you next time bye